So I guess we're trying to understand a little bit about Eliezer, Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Berkowitz, a really fascinating person, important person, uh, and yet someone whose influence is really um, uncertain, and his place in the you know, constellation of great intellectual leaders of modern orthodoxy, you know, uh, Jewish intellectuals of the 20th century, like he sort of, despite like writing a number of really important books and having important positions of influence, and a really like, you know, stellar career, um, you know, a generation after his death, his influence and impact, I think, is really uncertain. Uh, or maybe, maybe it's only now, like, sort of, you know, sort of he's having maybe, I can't say he's a writer. You know, people, are, people read his works, they study his works, people appreciate them. When I shared with some colleagues I was speaking about, there's a book of it, so people wrote to me and said, oh, this book is really important, this book is really important. Uh, like, like, people who might trust appreciate him a lot, but he, who are his students? Um, who are, who are, you know, like, what, what, what um, in that, that sense, what impact, you know, in terms, you know, do you shape a movement? Do you, do you, do you think, yes, you, you, what do you do, uh, what, what do you want to say? Well, I just finished reading a book about Weinberg. Oh. So you can, you can ask the same, yeah. you can ask the same question. Mark Shapiro's book. Yeah. Ah, very important book, okay, so, great. So, um, So you have these figures, these sort of lonely figures, and, and, yeah. Once the yeah. collapse of the of the Hillesheimer yeah. seminary yeah. and and the dispersion of all these people, yeah. um, their influence I don't know is scattered. I just remember going to the Shloshim for Eliezer Berkowitz. So oh wow, tell me what was that I, like? Yeah. I was appalled. That what? Um, one of the rabbis got up. This was nineteen ninety two, right? I don't remember exactly. Yeah, so. One of the rabbis got up and basically felt the need at the Shalashim to trash him. Wow. Because, and it was, and it was as if this, you know, this rabbinic fight that had been going on in the yeah. 1930s uh -huh. was going on in wow. Skokie wow. in 1990. That's a fascinating that. story. It's a sad story. It's a fascinating story. That's but, fascinating. But it, it, as I was reading Mark's book, yeah, I was remembering. How so interesting. So interesting. Weird that experience had been for yeah. me. That here you are. You can't find things to say that are positive to honor this man. Yeah. Obviously, the, the rabbi who was speaking was threatened wow. by Berkowitz. Yeah. And when he came to Skokie, he was in the philosophy department. Yes. Um, so, you know, how much of the, how yeah. much of what happened to him? And happened to Weinberg's the pupils yeah. from the Hillsheimer Seminary yeah. is a reflection of the politics um, that was going on. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. So let, let, let's take a step back and talk about the Hildesheimer Seminary and where it fits in with American or contemporary modern orthodoxy, and then we'll we'll sort of circle that question and look at some of these ideas. Modern orthodoxy, as um, it develops, neo orthodoxy, modern, you know, as it develops in Germany, has two major homes with some important distinctions. There's, there's the Frankfurt branch of German orthodoxy, and there's the Berlin branch of German orthodoxy. The Frankfurt branch of German orthodoxy is established, revitalized, dominated by the ideas of Rabbi Sam Schaffel Hirsch and his children and grandchildren, the Breuer family. Uh, this is a form of um, you know, neo-orthodoxy that emphasizes things like, uh, you know, what, what was, I mean, Sandra Phil Hirsch, you think, when you think about him and his writings, his ideas, you think of this real embrace of German culture uh, and art, and you know, the, you know and this, that, that a Jew can be a faithful Orthodox Jew and be a, a citizen who loves, you know, German civilization in, in its highest forms. Uh, you think of Sandra Phil Hirsch, who wrote a phenomenal, groundbreaking, important commentary on the Torah. He wrote a commentary on Tehillim. I uh, was a community builder, uh, wrote uh, multiple books of uh, Jewish thought and philosophy, not a um, major halachist, uh, not a Talmudist, uh, and somebody who was incredibly uh, opposed to any type of academic study of Judaism. And that's the Fritz Frankfurt Orthodoxy. Um, in Berlin, yeah, oh, yeah, go on. And there's another point to be made. Please. That um, his was the Austrit. Yes. Community. So they were not part Correct. of the um, Jewish communal structure. Yes, yes, yes. The very crucial piece of 
Shanfeld Hirsch's philosophy, which I believe probably has come up from time to time. Uh, he very strongly believed, and he, he sort of pushed this through when he lived in Hungary, and he brought it to Germany, this idea of ouster that Orthodox Jews could not be part of the same general Jewish community as non-Orthodox, it was led by non-Orthodox Jews. So in the context of, of Central Europe, where the Jewish community was a government institution, um, this meant that uh, he required Orthodox Jews to secede from the Jewish community and get special rights from the government to have their own Orthodox community, and that they're all supported by their tax dollars, but this meant that you couldn't be buried in the cemetery that your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were buried in, and that every communal institution had to be split into two nursing homes, uh, schools, orphanages, cemeteries, butcher shops, right, synagogues, everything had to be split into two, and you could either, you know, and, and uh, most Orthodox Jews, even in Frankfurt, didn't go along with that because they wanted to be buried in the cemetery with their parents and grandparents, but that was a very important part of his, uh, of his ideology. In Berlin, there was the Orthodox community there is established by Rav Hildesheimer, who was a contemporary of Rav Sanfil Hirsch. Rav Hildesheimer, uh, major Talmud Chacham, a halachist, a Talmudist, uh, he, when he dies, the mantle is taken over by his student, Rav David Hoffman, uh, also a very important scholar, important halachist. Um, you know, after David Zwihai, David Zwihai often dies, I think, in 1921, and Yaakov Weinberg then emerges as the dominant Talmudic halachic voice in Berlin. Uh, at the Berlin uh, Rabinar Seminar, the Hildesheimer Seminary in Berlin, this was an Orthodox rabbinical school, which um, required all its graduates to obtain uh, doctorates in some relevant academic field. So unlike the Frankfurt branch of neo-Orthodoxy, the Berlin branch very much felt that there was a place within Orthodoxy for academic study of Judaism, and they all had you know, PhDs in some relevant in Talmud and a lot of history of Jewish history or some relevant field. They all, you know, they had doctorates and, and some of them had university positions as well. But you know, it was a, in addition to being major Talmudists and halachic scholars. Um, neither one of these branches of German Orthodoxy really has any significant impact on American modern orthodoxy. American modern orthodoxy is the product of the Lithuanian Yeshiva world, as refracted through Rav Soloveitchik, right? Came from Eastern Europe, studied in, you know, got a PhD, in, not in any Jewish study, got a PhD not in any Jewish field, but in, in, his, in, in philosophy, and then came to Boston, and his father was at OU, and then Rav came to IU, and I think this is true, I, you know, I, so this to my wife, and she couldn't think of any counterexamples. We'll see if anyone watches the video. You, I think every congreg rabbi serving in a modern Orthodox congregation in the United States is the student of Rosh or one of his students. And if they're not, it's because they went to some other more right-wing Lithuanian yeshiva, or they went to, like, from Israel and they went to a yeshiva that was, you know, founded by a student of uh, Rav Kook or one of his students who also came from the Lithuanian yeshiva world. It was a student of Falajan. Every um, Rabbi serving a modern Orthodox congregation in the United States can trace their teacher's teacher teacher to the legend yeshiva, okay, or, you know, and one of its sister or one of its daughter yeshiva. Uh, so it's an entirely different place altogether from German Orthodoxy. Uh, not that they were cross, you know, right? Jakob Weinberg, you know, also learned in Eastern European yeshivas before he came to Germany. But it's in terms of this like German Orthodox culture and what it represented and what their ideals were and how they wrote and how they and, and the integration of ethics and and halacha and modernity and tradition and that, that whole like gestalt, um, like American modern Orthodox came from someplace different. Yes? I'm curious if that also applies to Sephardi modern Orthodoxuals in America. No, it probably doesn't. Yeah. Uh, they, they, have the, sure, they have their own yeshivot. And, I mean, Sephardi modern Orthodox is maybe an oxymoron, it's sort of a, diff a different uh, um, taxonomy, okay? But that's a fair point, so let's say. But there's yes? communication Yes. Say Weinberg and sure. And yes. Yes. Einstein. Correct. It's not as if these are not hermetically sealed silos. There's definitely communication and cross pollination and influence. And someone, I mean, that's the great thing about Mark Shapiro's book that he shows how someone like Yaakov Weinberg come from Eastern Europe and then appreciate German Orthodoxy, etc. Um, that's like his life was a wonderful example of that. But it's in terms of. Uh, like the, the type of education, the type of scholarship, and the type, right, and what was what German Orthodoxy, were, I mean, you know, like what it represented, that sort of just American modern Orthodoxy came from someplace else. And our, you know, our teachers were other people, with, you know, like it's, you know, with different expertises and different, you know, so, uh, you know, so this was a class. But so the you know, so the we, we talk about, which we've done before, we talk about his, I guess we'll have, I guess when we talk about uh, Brisk uh, later on in, this winter, we can talk more about that. But um, uh, just, so, so someone like, 
um, like Eliezer Berkowitz, who eventually makes, you know, who was a student at in Berlin, was a, had, had a, was a rabbi in, in Berlin before the war, uh, escapes to England and then makes his way, I think, Australia for a brief period of time, then came to Boston, was a congregational rabbi in Boston in the 50s, accepts a position to come to uh, HTC, where he is head of the philosophy department at HTC. So he trains rabbis for a generation, um, but he doesn't I don't think any of the rabbis he trained themselves became teachers of rabbis. And so in terms of whatever influence he may have had on that direct circle of his students, I don't know that it didn't necessarily uh, carry on. And uh, unlike, so compared to someone like Rav who trained a generation, he and his students trained like most of the modern Orthodox rabbis in the United States. Right? Again, the ones who came from, except, you know, except the ones who came from right-wing yeshivas who also had their own Lithuanian, you know, tracing back to Velezhin, or the ones who came from Israel who, via Rav Cook, also came from Velezhin. Uh, but, the, you know, so, so it's just a different, in terms of like how this, whatever impact he had on his own students, and many of them served congregations, but they didn't, he wasn't training uh, the trainers of rabbis. Well, yeah. What about, um, were there rabbis in, who went to Israel who had come out of the... Berlin, uh, yeah. that's a good question. There must have been. I don't know if they, I think the yeshivot in Israel were not established by those people. I could be wrong, it's my sense that they weren't. Because I know um, my family's been involved with um, the Kunstadt, so I'm not sure where they trained. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, so uh, look, it's not, it's not a, this is like a, uh, not, not, I could be wrong about this theory, but I, I just, but it's not, but it's certainly, it's, it's, it's a dominant story, it's certainly true, in terms of where, like, like sort of who, again, like my, you know, like I just think of my, my colleagues and people who write, you know, the one, you know, with like, uh, just like who, who are our teachers and, and who were, you know, my classmates, my colleagues, my older colleagues, my younger colleagues, like who are our teachers, et cetera. Um, it, you know, because as, you know, when, when Berkowitz came to Chicago, right, in the 50s and 60s. HGC was a more liberal rabbinical school than Yeshiva University in New York. In one very significant, I mean, maybe other ways, but one very significant way, they were sending rabbis to congregation with mixed seating. And they did so long after Yeshiva University in New York. It's not long after, but like, for a number of years after Yeshiva University in New York was, was no longer doing that. So he sort of arrived, and as, but, but in the 60s, as we learned about last week, <laughs> in the 60s, and in the 70s, HCC is moving decidedly to the right, and it emerges as like a, you know, a more you know, Karedi style yeshiva than compared to YU in New York, and that sort of comes about in the 60s and 70s, I think, right? So, so he's there at a, at a yeshiva where, where he's you know sort of he's or he was siloed in the philosophy department. Um, let's the people who are most you know taken by his philosophy, his modern philosophy, maybe some of them ended up as congregational rabbis and inspired a you know you know, a congregation, but in terms of like, you know, but they, they're all retired right now mostly, right? So they're not, they're not active anymore. In the 70s, he moves to Israel, and uh, he lives the last years of his life there, dies in 1992. Uh, I spoke on the phone with Rabbi Avi Weiss uh, this afternoon. He told me he visited with Berkowitz in Israel in the 80s, and he asked him, how are you doing? And he said, I'm lonely, I'm so very lonely. So that, you know, just like a, you know, when Weiss told it to me, really, really poignant, because, you know, that was, he died in 92. By the late 90s, I think already there was like this uh, uh, modern Orthodox, like, revival in some ways, right? You have Eda, and then, you know, in the mid-90s, and YCT and Jofa in the late 90s, and, right, et cetera, right? You had, you had this kind, you know, people who were really, like, taken by his ideas and wanting to, like, kind of build communities and institutions around his ideas that came five or ten years after his death. And somehow I, for whatever reason, got caught up in, like, I never, like, seriously contended with any of his writing before, which is also interesting. Like, this is like a test case of somebody who was, like, really, like, educated in distinctly modern Orthodox, you know, institute. I had six years of full-time yeshiva study, every single one of them in a decidedly modern Orthodox uh, context, and I never, like, read cover to cover any book by Elizabeth Berkowitz before. So, that, you know, it's, I don't know. That maybe that's my, I don't like bragging about my ignorance, so like, I'm not proud of that fact, but I, I'm very opposed to people who brag about their um, ignorance, but I think it's an interesting data point that like somehow, at my, you know, like I, they let me graduate, you know, without, you know, so um, in terms of like who my teachers were speaking, who they were quoting, which, you know, systems were like really inspiring to them, like somehow even those who, who admired him and spoke about him, it wasn't like, quite central enough that like, it was important for me to pick up his books, although I had a lot of classmates in all my yeshivas who, who did. So, um, let's look at some ideas. The first page just have this, so this, this, this is a really nice like, collection of essays 
that Shalem published almost 20 years ago on, you know, for my essential essays on Judaism. So uh, in the back they have an appendix. Just they have a little um, bibliography. I didn't copy the whole thing, but just 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 look at the books. So his first Hume and Deism. So that's that's a that, that's like a that's probably his dissertation or something. I don't know. Or maybe it's a it's, it seems like a pretty dense philosophical text. Um, another German book. What is the Talmud? Sounds maybe like a beginner's book or something. Um, Judaism, fossil or ferment in 1956. So he's responding, like, what does it mean? You know, he's, he's, he's trying to, to present an articulation of traditional halakhic observance that that's not a fossil, okay? That it's dynamic, that it's moving the world towards redemption, that it's ethically ennobling, um, not that it isn't, like, again, just a fossil, as people had said, as the critics, of, critics of Judaism had said. Um, Number eight, conditionality in marriage and divorce. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That was a sort of very controversial book he published in Hebrew. Uh, and then it was also, I think, reissued in English in a somewhat uh, watered-down version. Uh, he's try, he tried to come up with a solution to the Aguna problem by making marriages conditional, okay? Um, there, there are many who have suggested this. His, his approach, you know, he argued that if the marriage is uh, conditional, then it can be more easily nullified by Beitin right after the fact, should that be necessary. Um, and uh, well, that's, that's sort of, I guess we'll say a little, just maybe we'll skip ahead, sort of, since we mentioned it. Shapiro, in, in his, so, page 14, there's some of the story here, right? I think that's, yeah. yeah. So page 13, by the way, this is from Mark Shapiro's book, is a picture of him here with his, uh, with the Berlin uh, Rabbinical Seminary from 1943, thereabouts. He's uh, front row, fourth row, one, two, three, four, there he is, okay, he's a young man. Um, so, Hill Yaakov Weinberg, let's go back, maybe his name was mentioned before, he, again, he, before the war, he is the dominant figure at the Berlin Rabbinical Seminary. Um, he survives the war at, at a POW camp because he was a Soviet citizen. He came from Eastern Europe, he retained Soviet citizenship for whatever reason, the Germans stuck him in a POW camp, so he was, you know, relatively, as it turned out, you know, almost randomly, relatively uh, good conditions during the war. After the war, he settles in Montreux in Switzerland and uh, um, publishes a number of halakhic works collected in a volume called Sride Eish. Much of his writings was destroyed in the war. Sride Eish survived, certainly the first volume, because Eliezer Berkowitz took, it, took the manuscript with him when he left Germany. Um, and so, he, and then after the war, they reconnected and he enabled it to be published. And then the subsequent volumes of Sri De Aish were published like in the 50s and 60s by later writings, but much of his writings, books of his, were destroyed in the war. And, and I think he was very great. You know, so Berkowitz was a major student of his and, and, and he's responsible for the Sri De Aish, you know, surviving. So that, that's, that's special. In uh, 66, he publishes this, uh, this, this proposal to uh, solve the Aguna crisis by, or the problem of Aguna by allowing for conditional marriages that you would, when couples marry, they would make their marriage al a conditional act, we could do this in Halakha, uh, and then that gives uh, weight for the Beit Din, uh, easier, makes it easier for the Beit Din to nullify the marriage. So, so, so look, look, at that. look at the middle paragraph, page 190. You can see Weinberg's part, see these approbation to Eliezer Berkowitz's book, Initial Marriage and Divorce. In this, book, Berkowitz argued in favor of a certain form of conditional marriage, which would eliminate the possibility of women becoming agunotes because of their husband's refusal to grant a divorce. In a lengthy approbation, Weinberg elaborated on the importance of Berkowitz's book, particularly in contemporary times when more and more husbands were refusing to grant their wives Jewish divorces, and the wives were remarrying nonetheless in civil ceremonies. He also urged scholars to examine the material Berkowitz presents in favor of conditional marriages, noting that the crux of the dispute over this issue had more to do with conceptions of how Jewish marriage should be structured, a meta issue than with technical halachic points. The question which must confront scholars examining Berkowitz's book was formulated by Weinberg thus, is it more important to maintain the holiness and permanence of Jewish marriage in the sense of I will betroth thee unto me forever, vishtikli olam, so that also in religious circles, purity of marital life should not suffer the slightest impairment, or to consider the widespread difficult circumstances which exist today, an important consideration which must not be downplayed in the slightest. In other words, um, making divorce, making it easier to break marriages on the one hand, solves all these problems of, of Igun, of, of uh, recalcitrant husbands refusing divorce, to take part in divorce proceedings. On the other hand, um, it maybe weakens the sense that marriage is an institution that lasts forever and you know, is not something to be taken lightly. So that, 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 that's not a halakhic dispute, that's a dispute about values, that's a dispute about weighing um, 
kind of uh, like what's going to be better for the Jewish people? What's going to be better for the institution of marriage? Do we like strengthen marriage through making it difficult to end it, or do we um, like act on behalf of justice and, and protect these people, or strengthen marriage even by making it easier for the court, for the Beit to intervene and protect these uh, you know uh, women who are being abused in this way by this process? Um, th that's not a halakhic question, right? So he's um, So, so, what, so he definitely, so, anyway, so, so he definitely, um, yeah, I'll we'll finish, I'll read on. Although he may have had some specific objections to Berkowitz's proposals, Weinberg left no doubt that he approved the latter's general approach to finding a satisfactory method of conditional marriage. And in the end, blaming ill health, Weinberg was unwilling to involve himself in any serious discussion of Berkowitz's proposals or of conditional marriage in general. This is another example of his reluctance to chart new Lucky grounds independently. So Shapiro sort of is maybe, I don't know, is criticizing or just noting this is a factor in, uh, uh, in, in Weinberg's, you know, in, in Jakob, Weinberg, Jakob Weinberg's later career. Um, but uh, it sort of it says something that, that Berkowitz felt that this was like his task to wade in. I, I, like he wasn't, he hadn't published, I guess to publish a book like that, you have to be really halakhically, like, really holding, like, to have a master of the sources, to write with confidence, to chart new grounds. That's like a bold step to take. And, and to do so in a way that if you Jakob Weinberg writes an introduction to your book and says, this is great, this is like an important contribution to scholarship, that shows, like, that he did it well, right? That he did it well, that he was qualified to write that sort of book. Um, it's just so interesting, though, that, that he, uh, you know, because I'm not used to somebody, right, who had never published you know, tshuva before, you know, kind of lay, you know, writing these like halakhic essay, book length essay even, that would really chart new grounds halakhically. That, that, that seems like different from what I'm used to, okay? So that's sort of interesting, right? So he could do it, he was qualified to do it, he was definitely a Talmud Chacham, he had the, uh, sufficiently to take on the scholarship and to research and write a book of that sort, chart new grounds in a really complicated, fraught, sensitive um, area of Jewish law. And yet, you, you know, how could a book like that be successful when it wasn't written by somebody who had already kind of proven himself as a, as a halachist, as an authoritative, you know, um, right? He didn't have, right, you know, so whatever. So that, that, that's, you, you, you're, you're like, what do you mean by that? What are you talking about? Well, because look, his earlier I books and his later books are books of philosophy, right? So, I don't yeah. see, I don't see that as separated from what was going on politically. Um, because Weinberg kept looking over his shoulder and looking to the East for approval and wasn't getting it. And then after the war, wasn't, um, you know, when he, when he was coming up with a, um, a halachic position, he wasn't firm. At least I got the impression from Mark's book. He, he wasn't um, strident. Mm -hmm. It was as if, almost as if he had his wings clipped. And in this particular, on this particular yeah. issue, given Weinberg's personal situation, how could he come out in support of making divorce easy, given his personal life? Um, I don't know. It's interesting. I, 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 don't, I don't know about that. I, it, 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 you know, the footnote here is really fascinating cause, because uh, Nathan Kasher wrote a start, you know, very attack of the book. Um, uh, here, let's look, let's look at, uh, um, so hold, yeah, that's very interesting, okay, so there's a whole, whole little, you know, it, it, it seems, you know, there, there, there are, there are um, contentions that Philip Jakob Weinberg withdrew his approbation, and he was, that seems to be, seems to be very unlikely because he wrote a letter to Leo Young in New York, like a few weeks before he died, saying, no, the book is fine, the book is good, the book's important, so that, it, was, it wasn't really time for him to recant, because he died a few weeks later. Um, uh, you can see, um, yeah, look, look at, uh, you can see in, in, in footnote 83, um, in the, yeah, look, look, look at footnote 82 here. Weinberg's approval of certain types of conditional marriages and his belief that halachists should continue work in this area are seen in his letter to Rabbi Leo Young, dated in 19th June 1957. In the questionable letters of Nachum Kasher in the next note, Weinberg explained that his sympathetic attitude toward Berkowitz's endeavor was due to his being unaware that the issue had already been the focus of a major dispute in the United States between the Orthodox and the conservative rabbinates with the Orthodox forbidding conditional marriages. So, uh, so in other words, that at least, you know, one, you know, he thinks that 
the letter was, was, didn't happen, but that's also like another piece of this, right? He's writing, he, he's writing, he's coming out with a defense of a halakhic stance, which had already become controversial in this like interdominational turf wars, which was a kind of politics. Um, but the second paragraph of footnote 30, um, 83, uh, you can see um, Berkowitz's final statement on this issue was found in his Jewish Women in Time and Torah, which was published in 1990, shortly before he died. I regret to say that my work has not been given serious consideration. Instead, all kinds of statements have been made maintaining that my teacher, Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg Zetzal, withdrew the moral support that he gave to the work. I have to declare that in all these statements and rumors, there is not the slightest truth. And, uh, and Shapiro thinks that he's right, that there really was no evidence that Weinberg was. So, I, I, you know, I, again, I, when I think of, like, you know, gra you know so, I imagine somebody who's going to write, you know, th think of like sort of like major, like revolutionary or, or evolutionary, like important shifts in Jewish law. You think of people whose, whose, who are, whose output is defined by their legal writing, um, and that, and, and for Berkowitz, it was his philosophical writing, his essays on Judaism and post-Holocaust theology, and and what it meant in Judaism and ethics, and, and like very important books. But he um, didn't produce a lot of other halachic writings. So it's clear he was capable of doing so. It's clear he was capable of doing something very well. And it's clear that Hilary Yaakov Weinberg, who was certainly a halachist, right, par excellence, saw this work and said, other serious halachists should contend with this and should follow up on this, on the ideas that are supported here. But, but it, you know, but it, um, but some kind of, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to make of, you know, the, uh, I guess I'm not surprised that it didn't like, oh, you know, didn't like rally everyone behind him, right? Just, you know, that, that, that didn't surprise me. Uh, but then maybe I'm just also the product of my own time and my own education, you know, right? Maybe, you know, like, when I, you know, by the time I was educated, it was already obvious that, of course, you know, it's only like, a, you know, post you know, who kind of chart new grounds in halakha, and he wasn't a post you know, because that wasn't his major output. You understand what I'm saying? It's almost like a, I, I don't know how much, it's hard for me, you know, like a fish doesn't know it's wet, right? So it's hard for me to, you know, like, like the, I don't want to retroactively say, well, of course it wasn't going to be, you know, embraced because he wasn't, you know, he hadn't produced many, many volumes of Black writings until that point. But I'm also thinking that in the aftermath of the world in which this wasn't embraced and people who influence Halakha are people who produce multiple volumes of Black writings. But the politics, I, I just There's always politics. Post game also, I mean, Rosha Feinstein also was involved. There was political stuff in his stuff as well, but he was clearly a post right? That's not, it, it wasn't, Everyone has, you know, everyone has politics, right? It's just a question of whose, whose halakh pronouncements are, are, are seen by the community as authoritative, that people are going to live their lives and take risks and, you know, and conduct their marriages, right, according to these theories. Because he wasn't, right, he, he wasn't, he wasn't had, I didn't have a bait in that listened to him. He wasn't training rabbis who were going to go out into the field and kind of implement his ideas in the marriages that, you know, so it's so... Uh, and it wasn't as if there, was like, there were communities that were already used to turning to him for halakhic like guidance on 35 other issues because of, through his other writings and et cetera. That wasn't the role he served as. But his role was, I mean, going back to Weinberg. Yeah. I mean, he was getting so much flack from, from the East. I, I don't think, so he, he was already, he was near death when this book was published. No, he no, wasn't no, going I to, I yeah. understand that. But I think that there was so much undercutting from yeah. Eastern Europe of what was going on in Berlin, and then you have this destruction yeah, yeah. that um, the, the circle of support was, right. was dashed. That's okay. So there was, uh, right, okay. But he also, I mean, he was much younger, though, right? Eliezer Berg was much younger. He came to Chicago, you know, he had a career here, he taught you right. for a generation. You know, so uh, it's a little bit, it's a generation later. I think the dynamic's a little bit different. He emerged. He was much younger after the war. He got out earlier, and he was much younger, and he wasn't, a, you know, he escaped before the war started, and he was younger, and he had a whole career, and three continents before he came to Israel and wrote this book. So I, or he wrote the book still in Chicago, but, um, um, so maybe when, so maybe in the aftermath of that destruction, he didn't have, there was no community that was primed, let's put it that way, I would say that's fair. You know, there was no community primed to accept his, uh, to, it, that chain of Hild Rav Hildesheimer and Rav Dovetsi Hoffman and the Sri Ish to Eliezer Berkowitz, that, that community that was, sort of had this, you know, that that community was, was destroyed. And so there was no, so even if the, you know, he was the last of that line of great scholars, he no longer had a community to, to leave. Maybe that, that's a fair, I think that's, that's true. Can I say something there? Um, I, 
I, I was just, but, but, Say it but anyway, I'm okay. curious. Yeah. Um, other rabbis were able to reestablish themselves in America and That's create that long yeah. line. Um, do you think that there were other rabbis that had already laid the groundwork and had the monopolies, or there just wasn't space for that, or there was, um, or you know, there were forces that were actively trying to kind of shut down that moderation that was coming out of Berlin? That's fascinating. I hear what I'd say. Right, because you, you, know, you, you see there were, there were other right, survivor rabbis who lost everything, came here with nothing, and some of them, so one, okay, so one, I have a few theories. I don't, I don't want to get too right. Like, text I like to look at, but I, and, and this is very speculative, so I don't want to like, but I'll just say, you know, one possibility is that it could be a very, very small percentage of these refugee survivor rabbis who build anything that's big, and so, you know, for every Satma Rebbe, Belzer, you know, you know, Belzer Rebbe, who, you know, Gera Rebbe, yeah, you, know, so. you know, right, at, you know, or uh, Varanka, you know, or who came before, you know, but, you know, like, who, who build these big things from nothing, there were a hundred others who came with nothing and, and you know, ended up as, uh, you know, uh, insurance salesmen or whatever, or, or, or never, or had little shtibles and never amounted to anything here, right? And so, it could just be a numbers game, right? And just the vast majority maybe don't reestablish, and the few that did are just like, we just think of them. Or it could be, like the ones who, you know, there's the, the, some of them were institution builders, and maybe that's what, you know, the ones who, uh, the ones who establish schools, establish yeshivot, establish communities, is that maybe that's, those are the ones, you know, you, you know, in the, I mean, Breuer's is an interesting counterexample, because the Frankfurt Orthodox community was able to reestablish itself in Washington Heights and preserve a great deal of its kind of communal identity with, you know, so some distortions along over the decades, but, you know, they still, they, you know, they still, they did succeed in a way that some others were. So, uh, you know, maybe that would be the thing to look at, like the story and to examine, like, what were the, the factors that, that led to uh, the kind of post-war, like, ability to rebuild versus not. And, you know, so and it's probably multiple variables and multiple factors, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, um, okay. Let's look at page three, okay? Let's look at some text and see something, right? So. so this is an essay on ethics and uh, religion. I think it's fascinating, okay? It's not enough, of course, so it started at the top of, of page 18. It's not, uh, page three, whatever, 318. It's not enough, of course, to be able to point to the source of the obligation of ethical principles as already indicated the task is to induce man to implant the demands of morality in human conduct. We've observed the dismal record of human performance in this area testifies to man's most tragic failure in history. This failure, I have suggested, is due mainly to believe that reason implies both authority and power, but foregoing discussion address the matter of authority remains as the question of reason's power. Okay? So he thinks that the, like the fatal error of Western philosophical ethical tradition is thinking that it's sufficient to know what the right thing to do is and that's going to make people do the right thing. Okay, so it talks about the authority of, you know, it comes from God, or it comes from wherever it comes from, that's one question, but then how does it actually, um, like, make the world better? And he goes, like, a, you know, compares the Greek philosophical tradition and the Christian ethical tradition and the Marxist ethical tradition and says they're all, like, some form flawed in some similar way of thinking that it's sufficient to teach people what the right thing to do is, if they're not like that, that doesn't actually make help people do the right thing. Um, turn the page. Skip, we're skipping ahead a little bit. So, for example, he says in um, in Judaism, our practical mitzvot are a way to train our bodies as well as our souls. Look at the last paragraph on page four. beyond inhibition, which we, as we shall see, leads to sublimation, the law proceeds to the task of educating the human body, the indispensable instrument of all action for the ethical deed. Okay? But how does one educate the body? Since the age of antiquity, Western civilization has mistakenly believed that it's possible to convince the body by reasoning with it, by telling it what it may or may not do, and so it's hoped in vain for effective ethical conduct through education. At its best, Western civilization was talking to the mind and never really reached the body. The body is not accessible to logical reasoning. One can only teach it by making it do things. One does not learn to swim by reading books on swimming technique, nor does one become a painter by merely contemplating the styles of different schools. One learns to swim by swimming, to paint by painting, to act by acting. One learns how to do anything by doing it. This applies nowhere more strictly than in the realm of ethical action. 
So this is his defense of Judaism from the you know, Christian and you know, critique that it's you know, legalism, from the Kantian you know, critique that it's you know, heteronormative, you know, um, heteronymous, uh, you know, like opposed, wrote, you know, actions, right? What Judaism is, halakhic Judaism, mitzvah observance is, it, it's, it's a way to integrate the soul and the body, the mind and the body, um, that our ethical actions are not just taught to us, like be good and be ethical and love your neighbor, but like let me do things, let me train my body to do justly and kindly and ethically in the world. And that's what mitzvah are about. Um, I think it's a kind of cool idea. Um, Is that possibly a criticism of kind of a, I guess mostly a Char Israeli Haredi, I don't know if this was, this was there um, at, at the time he was writing this, but kind of the Israeli Haredi model of, you know, a, a good Jewish life is sitting and studying all day and... Oh, um... For so I, I know it's real, it's, 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 it's a, it's not, he's not, it's a critique I would say of maybe like a kind of a Lithuanian, brisker, like, you know, you know, well, I'll put it this way. I actually think, we'll talk about this later, I think, in the, I think the, the prep, I think the, uh, there's a strong emphasis on chesed and interpersonal kindness in the brisker thought. I think that's actually, you know, and going back to Chaim Brisker itself, actually, you know, who used to, his home, what people used to like drop off there, uh, people who couldn't take care of their babies would bring them to Chaim Brisker's home and they like raise orphans in their home like that. So that, that, that ethos of kindness was very much part of the brisker, like, gestalt and, and, and just worldview and, and ethos. And so that was integrated into their learning. I think what's, however, in brisk, certainly learning about mitzvot is maybe even more important than doing them, right? Uh, because when you study Torah, when you learn about mitzvot and you conceptualize them and you understand them and what's the nature of the mitzvah and how do you do it, right? What you're in so doing, one is um, like coming to understand God's will through one's discovery and you're serving God with your mind, which is the highest faculty. You're, you're approaching God's will through your unique, new understanding of the Torah, that's much more important than like just doing it right, whatever, than like shaking a lulav, right? Like learning about a lulav, that's, right, as opposed to actually touching one, okay? So um, that, that is like a, maybe a characterization, maybe it's fair, maybe it's not a risk, and this is very different. Here the mitzvah performance is training. On page 23, compared to an army, the army goes out and does drills, and it trains, and mitzvah train us, okay? Um, So you train and train and train until it becomes second nature. It's a long sort of extended metaphor there on, on page five. Um, so look at page one, look at page six. The second, second sentence in the top of page, of page six. Any one commandment of the Decalogue, you shall not commit adultery, or you shall not kill, or you shall not covet, is an ethical injunction di directed to a real situation of conflict or temptation. In order to obey it, one must inhibit powerfully aroused passions. One does not learn the art of self-control merely by reading the Bible. One learns it by actually controlling oneself in the face of a challenge. Okay, you get up in the morning for chakras, you'll be able to withstand the temptation to steal your neighbor's whatever, okay? Like that, that's this theory. You don't eat the non-kosher um, ice cream and you train yourself to exercise self-control. There are things that I want, there are things that are tasty, things that are desirable, I'm not gonna eat it because God said no. And in so doing, one trains oneself to like, make the really ethically significant choices in the right way. Because your whole life has been, you know, teaches you self-control and you are constantly uh, engaging in self-control. So ritual laws is it's an indirect attack of Jewish intention on the essential self-centeredness of the biophysical element. Okay, I get up in the morning and I go to chakras. That is a way of um, helping me be more ethical, not because there's something ethical about going to chakras, but it's, but, it, but it's training my body to be disciplined. And that, like, my responsibilities to Judaism are more important than being really tired in the morning. Or it's cold out, I want to stay indoors. Okay? So I'm going to arouse myself. I'm going to do this thing that Torah wants me to do, uh, even though my body's objecting, even though I want to do it, and then I do this every day, and I'm trained in, like, my body is trained to listen to the Torah. And then in those really dramatic moments where there's temptation and there's incitement and there's you know, some powerful urge, 
okay, to do something that would be wrong in a moral way, um, the Jew who, you know, whose life is about self-control is able to withstand. So what do you think of that theory? Sounds not true to you? What do you think it works? I was just thinking about how I'm so repulsed by the idea of, you know, like eating lobster or crab or any of that, sort of like a gut level, just kind of nothing about it appeals can see it every day, and I'd never be tempted to eat it, kind of thing. But ah, so you're saying it's like a, it's, you, it's it, a little it, bit. It's not the same as other right, 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 right. When it comes to right, so maybe the self maybe doesn't maybe once these things become self, right? So sometimes what happens is what becomes self nature is not the discipline, but just the the acts kind of separate from like because once you're trained not to eat lobster, you don't have an appeal of lobster, and so you're not you're not actually. Um, training yourself, training your body in self-control by abstaining from tray food because you no longer want to eat tray food anymore. Uh, yeah, that, that would be the, so you're saying you can break down. Yeah, it comes I just natural. never experienced the, whatever the pleasures are of it, so it's just an entirely kind of negative thing to look at or think about for certain, you know, like, Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Any other reactions in this? Yeah, yeah. I think it's powerful. Yeah, I, so I, I guess, I don't know if it's, you want to say more? No, no. I, I just, I, I think, I, you know, um, I, I think, you know, like I, I think food that's, you know, just because we have individual tastes in food, right, that's probably, um, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, but, um, you know, I, I guess, I, I hope that nobody walks around with, you know, urges to kill people, but, but even when you compare it to, like, things like anger, right, um, I think we all, you know, from even infancy have, urges to be angry um, and so we you know learn to control ourselves um, by being you know by it's like that moment of chuva right you're in the situation yeah. in which you want yes, to be angry yes, and you yes. actively choose not to do it yeah I, mean, I, I just hope that like maybe you, you, somebody who lives like a observant life would just say to himself or herself like I've invested so much in in like this lifestyle it costs so much so like, therefore, I'm gonna, like, I'm not gonna lie even when it would be really convenient, or I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna report this income on my taxes or whatever. I'm gonna do this hard, challenging, ethical thing that I'm a little scared to, I'm gonna act with integrity because, like, because I get up every morning for chakras, and so, like, in order to, to justify that investment of time, like, how could I then not, you know, um, act with integrity in this, like, kind of frightening situation where I'm challenged? Like, you know, some sort of self-awareness, like this is who I've become so, yeah. at this point. Something like, yeah, yeah. To, to yeah. be counter to who I really am. Yeah. The problem is you could look at it and ask if it really works. Like, right. said, there are a lot of Jews who will turn down a business deal that would, would require them to work on Shabbos, but wouldn't turn down a business deal that's unethical. Yeah, that, that's, that's fair. I would say there have been a few, there's like more than one person since I've moved here has asked me halachic, ethical guidance about very lucrative business opportunities that they felt were like ethically a little smelly and like so like it does it is there are people who do like kind of but it's very easy to compartmentalize and put it that way and so I don't know if empirically like this theory works I, I think it's a nice but as like an explanation to have self-awareness like what are we doing this for like how is this like making the world better how is this making me better that I'm doing all these mitzvot that I'm saying brachas that I'm not eating you know tray food that I'm you know, having two sets of dishes, and like, like, what is this all about? And the answer is, I'm integrating my values in my body. I'm training my body to listen to the Torah. I'm integrating my values in my body because, or to make the world a better place, it's not enough just to say nice things. The body has to be trained to do the right thing. Uh, even when there's great temptation to do the wrong thing. Um, there's something I hold very poignant, also, again, like, in terms of, like, his, you know, somebody who grows up in, in, in Germany, and I like, just sort of, I, I just sort of like that to, uh, Kind of look back and, at Western civilization and say, like, what went wrong? Okay, like, what was the problem? How, how did this not work? How did all these wonderful ideals not prevent this barbarism? Um, so his an one answer here is, well, you know, the problem is it was just ideas, and we didn't train our bodies to like care about them. You can't just tell people the truth and expect that they'll do the right thing. You can't, right? Because they got all it right. The German philosophers, the ever, you know, the Christians, the you know, they all they, they they totally had wonderful ideas about ethics and morality and justice, but Somehow the body wasn't trained. The bodies weren't trained. And they thought that it was enough just to say the right thing and that it wouldn't would sink in. Um, on page uh, 28, there's a real distinction with Rosalavechi. He talks about prayer, even just like saying the rote 
just praying, just saying, you know, um, right, a few lines after the bottom of page eight, automatically praying lips may count for little in comparison with kavanah, the directedness of the praying soul toward God in ecstatic submission, yet they too represent a form of submission of the organic self to the will to pray. Um, so, right, and the Talmud has found the remark that we owe a debt of gratitude to the head because it bows as prescribed when we reach the paragraph of modem in our prayer without waiting for the explicit order from our consciousness to do so. It bows discouraged, according to the one of biblical laws of Baal Shukran. Anyway, so, um, oh, sorry, that, that's, that's the next, that's a skip, that's a jump. Um, um, the next page is, is a jump, that's why the sentence doesn't, doesn't go through. Um, this is a very, this is a contrast to Soloveitchik, who's, you know, and many other philosophers of modern Judaism who spoke very much about the importance of sincerity and, and, and God awareness in prayer, etc. And he's saying, oh, God awareness is great, but there's a value in prayer just as your body going through the motions, your body is praying, that, that's good, because bo actually bodies need to be integrated and brought into, into this life as well, into this, this project of um, religion. Um, I would, yeah. also, I would also say that this is a lot of this is very intrinsic, right, and very personal. Whereas when you say like you know like how did it go wrong? How come you know some people that lead observant lives, uh, observant lives, do shady business deals? Well, you know, you get up for shafrit in the morning, and everyone knows you're there, and sometimes people will know that you're not there. Um, you know, a lot of things that we do, we where there are social pressures and there are, there's a community to hold us accountable. Um, you know, if you're you know, running a shady business deal and either the community doesn't know about it or the, in some communities it, they don't think it's shady, um, then uh, you know, it, it, it kind of diminishes, the external factors diminish and you're relying on this internal um, you know, moral compass um, that sometimes breaks down, but it seems like Berkowitz really um, is saying like it, it always needs to be there, and this is what he, this is what he's relying on, really. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, um, so I want to I want to just introduce one other, at least one other idea, um, which I think is of significant. He also writes very much, you know, and some some extras about the next pages. Of, uh, like two other ideas that are important. One, one is uh, his idea of the oral Torah as a necessary like um, counterpart to the written Torah. The written Torah, obviously, like the Torah, we call the Torah, like the scrolls, it's just the letters. Oral Torah is the interpretation and the application of these eternal fixed written Torah guidelines to lived experience. And he thinks that's done with the principles of of svara, of sort of like kind of logic and intuition and, and sort of reasonableness and 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 also um, sense of what's of um, better word for this like what's what's possible um, is a more elegant word for that to say that a sense of like what, what what's practicality maybe of sort of how it's implemented how it can be implemented in the real world and also done with the guidance of sort of meta-halachic ethical principles that we know about from the prophets and from mitzvah in general. And so he was very sort of, um, and he felt that the codification of the oral Torah in the Mishnah and the Talmud was a tragedy because it could have codified that which is supposed to be um, much freer and, and intuitive, you know, and uh, some of more kind of radical, right? You know, you say, I have an essay that he published in Tradition uh, I think the, the editors, when they published it, they said, we really don't agree with this guy, but, you know, he's written some good stuff from, from before, so, you know, pay, pay attention to it. He writes, it's called, you know, Orthodox Judaism in a World of Revolutionary Transformation. So it's written in 1965, talks about the 60s, this, like, new age, everything's changing, revolution, the world is changing, and we have to change, too. Um, and what does it mean, okay? Um, how do we, you know, we have to, like, uh, make halacha relevant, for modern conditions of Jewish existence here. Um, okay, we have to just like really like think about halakha differently. Okay, we have to, you know, uh, you know, it wasn't, he, in this article he doesn't like make any concrete 
um, proposals, but he's talking about like this need for this like oral Torah, more of that creativity, more of that freedom um, to, to apply the Torah in, in, in real, in, in uh, sort of new circumstances. Different from, let's say we'd find, you know, in, in you see some of like from that same period of time, some of the people who were advocates for conservative Judaism in the 60s, they would talk about this synthesis between modern culture and, and uh, you know, the Torah, and then that, that sort of drives this process. You know, some of, some of these conservative writers were almost like in a Hegelian way. There's traditional Judaism as the thesis, then the modern society is the antithesis, and there's a new synthesis that has to be formed, which then becomes a thesis for the next generation. This is how Judaism develops. They were like sort of Hegelian thinkers in the conservative movement. And Berkowitz, it wasn't about making Judaism, like updating it and sort of reconciling it with contemporary times. It was about like applying ancient Judaism to the new circumstances, right? It's not about a reconciliation. It's not about a synthesis. It's about um, like halakha in a, in a freed, more oral Torah kind of way being uh, guided by, again, practicality, by implement how things can be implemented, guided by this prophetic ethical vision as well. The critique of that idea, which is actually one of the ways actually, one of the first times I <laughs> was exposed to Elias Berkowitz was a critique of this position by, none other than Tamar Ross, the sort of important Israeli feminist uh, thinker and postmodern like thinker as well, and I, if I recall, her, her objection to this idea is that it, it, the, the objectivity with which Berkowitz thinks that we can engage in this process of identifying what are the ethical guiding principles of the Torah that we are supposed to use to interpret the Torah like, is itself contingent on like, who we are and where we are. And there is no like, neutral vantage point in which to say, well, I can identify, right? I can identify these are the ethical principles of the Torah that we're going to use to like, update and revive the halachot. Um, and so she felt that, he, that, that she felt was why his kind of feminist, like halachic feminist like, advocacy couldn't succeed because it kind of caused this like, sort of theologically, philosophically had this, this, this weakness of, uh, you know, like I think the Torah is all about you know, equality <clears throat> and enhancing human dignity, uh, and I'm going to use those meta halakhic ideals to, like, revive, revise the Jewish divorce, you know, laws. But maybe you, you know, but somebody else can say, well, actually, I think, you know, no, the meta halakhic ideas of the Torah are about the sanctity of marriage and stability and whatever it might be, some, something else, right? And there's, there's really, there's no neutral position with which one can say, this is the, what the prophetic spirit is telling us, this is what the distilled ethical principles of the Torah actually is that we can then use in a, you know, we can all agree on is what are the meta halachic principles that we should use to interpret the Torah. So she feels like postmodernism maybe solves that problem. We've spoken about, we can talk about that, you know, we, will, we will talk about that later. Uh, but that she felt was sort of a, a weakness in, in, his, uh, in his argument. I think, again, I said before, he was in his lifetime, in the end of his life, a very lonely man. I don't think he saw his ideas not really having traction didn't leave behind students who were like carrying on in his path. And yet, I think in the decade after his death and the generation since then, I think there has been this, there is a liberal orthodox community that is willing to um, push the envelope halakhically, try new things. There is halakhic advocacy motivated by some of the modern values that Berkowitz um, pre presented. And I think the vision of Judaism that's rooted in mitzvah performance as opposed to like the brisker like learning. I, I think that's actually quite relevant for um, like a modern Orthodox community which does by and large hopefully like love mitzvah but isn't embracing like the yeshiva model of, of like you know learning as like a society of learners, right? Unlike the Haredi community, our community doesn't invest a lot of time in Torah study. It doesn't seem to be the animating guiding mitzvah of our community even though that's the world in which all of our rabbis, 100% of our rabbis were trained, right? All the rabbis of our community, right? We all come from Velazhin, uh, but our community is maybe living a life more um, inspired by this kind of ethos of, you know, mitzvot make me better and make the world better and make my community better, uh, right? I'm training my body, I'm learning, right, et cetera, et cetera whatever it might be. Um, and so I think, I think actually he, his ideas are, are, are quite significant significant for now, for today's age, as I could have discovered, and, and I think uh, 
you know, ha had he been able to live another 10 or 20 years, I think he would have seen, like, got a lot more satisfaction from the direction of at least certain portions of our community, which I think are very much like living out his, um, his ideals. But the point, it's an interesting point because um, the impression I have is that the, the people who um, trained with him yeah. were living 